Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome in. We are so glad that you're here to join us for worship today. Uh, my name is Aaron, and this is our awesome Cornerstone band. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand uh, if you are able to, and we're going to get into this time of worship together. All right. Our Psalms today comes from 46, 4 through 7, and verse 10. So I'll invite you people of God to read this with me. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, and she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He says, be still and know that I am God. Amen. Pray with me. God, we love you and we thank you. Thank you so much for bringing us here, Lord. Thank you for your provision, for your hand that you rest upon us every day. Lord, no matter what our week was last week or what it's going to be like this week, God, we give this time that we have to you. God, you welcome us with open arms. You call us as we were to become new creations in you. So God, we let go of the things that hold us back and we reach out our hands to receive the portion that you have for us. God Almighty, we love you and we thank you. Let this time be an offering to you. In your name we pray. Amen. I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear, for I am safe. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, and I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? stand against the power of our God and you shine in the shadows and you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God an almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God and you shine in the shadows and you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god an almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god and you shine in the shadows and you win 
gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
of an altar of broken stone that you delight in the offering you have the heavens to call your throne that you abide in the stone thousand angels surround your throne to bring you praise that will never cease. But hallelujah from heaven above, to still your favor in the world. As we sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Should the fire
Gracious and loving God, Lord, we praise you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together this morning and worship you. Lord, I don't know how people got here this morning. I may not know what they are carrying into this space, but God, I pray that people would have a fresh encounter with you. Lord, the God who created them, who loves them, and who delights in all that we are called to be. God, we love you, and we continue to pray the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning. Y'all may go ahead and be seated. My name is Haley. I'm the director of the college ministry here. And whether you are joining us in the room or online, welcome. It is so good to be with you this morning. Now, I have a goal for all of our college students, and that it's they learn that their faith can be integrated into every area of their lives. And our prayer as a church is that that is our prayer for you as well, that your businesses, your family, your friends, your relationships, that everything would change and transform because you know and love Jesus. For some of you that may be asking, how does that actually work? What does it look like to serve God and all that I do, especially in the workplace? I want to invite you to an event that we're having here on April 18th. We're inviting Mark Whitaker, who's the Vice President of Care and Culture at Coca-Cola Consolidated. And he's going to be speaking about exactly what it looked like to implement Christian principles into his workplace. He's going to share about his success and all the ways that he's been able to integrate his faith into his life. You can register for that event at hpmc.org slash events or by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Now, we want to be a church that helps you grow in your faith, but we also want to be a church that walks alongside you in every season of life. And we have so many ways for you to get plugged in and to receive the specific support that you may need. But I want to highlight just one opportunity for you this morning. If you or someone you know has been impacted by divorce, we're having an event here on May 2nd where Michelle Spurgeon will come and speak and share some tactics on how to overcome loneliness. She'll create space for you to connect with other people in the season of life as well. So again, you can find out all the details for that event online at hpmc.org slash events. Everything within the life of the church, our ability to impact not only just your life, but the community of Dallas and the world at large, all is made possible by your generosity. So I want to invite you at this time to go ahead and give virtually at hpmc.org slash give or scanning that QR code. And while we may not pass the offering plates this morning, we will have the ushers at the back of the service that can receive your offering as well. I'm excited for this morning. So sit in, settle in, and turn your eyes to the screen as we prepare our hearts for the message.
All right, you can go ahead and grab a seat, grab a seat. All right, we are glad that you're here this morning. My name is Matt. I'm one of our pastors here and glad that you're here. We're in the middle of this series in the book of Revelation, trying to get our um, minds wrapped around what this book is all about. Some of you hear the book of Revelation and it means nothing to you at all. Um, Some of you hear it and it's kind of scary. Some of you hear it, and you grew up kind of like me. I knew that it was there, but never really dealt with it. People seem kind of embarrassed by it. It's like we pretended like it wasn't at the end of the Bible. I don't know when you hear the book of Revelation what it um, brings to mind for you. But what we're after in these five weeks is we are after opening up this book to try to get our minds wrapped around how it all ends. Because how it all ends has a lot to say to us about how we live between now and then. That's what the book was written for. The book was written for people who were living in a complicated and a difficult world. And the book gave them encouragement. It redirected them. It gave them guidance on how to live between now and when everything gets put back together. Our world is complicated and difficult difficult in different ways, but still, we, we today need that same guidance. And when we get our eyes wrapped around how it ends, it helps us to know how to live between now and then. It's like that old axiom about beginning with the end in mind. If you want to know what you need to be doing this quarter, you got to have an idea of what you want the next 5, 10, 15 years to look like. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to read us a couple of passages The first passage that I'm going to read is a glimpse, like a brief glimpse of what heaven looks like. The second passage is a brief glimpse of God's perspective on the world. Now, specifically at the time 2,000 years ago, but we can draw some things from that for today also. And then after we read those passages, I want to reflect a little bit on what they might mean for us today. Get really, really practical. And then I'm going to give you some time at the end to just reflect on this. This is a lot. They just kind of soak it in, reflect on all this. Think a little bit about how it ends and how that might be impacting how you live your lives today. Before we do any of that, I'm going to invite you to just take a deep breath. Settle in just a little bit. I'm going to be quiet for about 10 or 15 seconds. Then I'm going to pray for us and we'll get going. God, thank you for this morning and for this group of folks that we get to be together this morning and that we get to start our weeks carving out 60 minutes and doing our best to get our full attention on you through the songs we sing, the prayers we pray, and now looking at this scripture together. During this time, God, I pray that you guide us and guide this conversation. There's a lot of imagery here that it can be difficult to get our minds wrapped around. So God, I pray that you use the words of the scripture, the words that I prepared, but that you also just work by the power of your Holy Spirit to help us to see a little bit more clearly. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, the thoughts of our minds be pleasing to you. You're our rock and our redeemer. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so last time we were together, last Sunday, we were talking a lot about the eclipse. It was going to be the next day. How many of you watched the eclipse? You saw it? Most of you did. That's good. A uh, few observations about the eclipse. Here's number one for me. It was way cooler than I thought it would be. Anybody else feel that way? I mean, I wasn't sleeping on it. I mean, I didn't think it was going to be insignificant, but it was way more awe-inspiring than I expected it to be. His second observation. 1% of the sun is a lot. I mean, did you notice that? I mean, there was just a little bit of it left, and it's darker outside, but it is not dark outside. And then the moon moves just a little bit, and there's Venus. It's unbelievable. And then it comes back, and 1% not only lights up everything around you, you can't even look at it, and it casts crazy shadows on the ground, all this stuff. 1% of the sun is a lot. 
Uh, last observation, not nearly as significant. I had a moon pie for the first time in a long time. <laughs> they're, not, they're not that good. It's just like a, it's like a raw s'more. That's all that it is. Uh, back to the 1% thing, though. S- sit, sit in this 1% thing for just a second. That's kind, of, that's kind of the business that we're in. It's kind of what we're, we're after together. I mean, in general, in our lives, but especially with what we're about to do. Just minute, This 1% thing is really what we're after. The Apostle Paul, one of the first Christian pastors, he said near the end of his life, I only see dimly. Like, I don't fully get it. I only see God dimly. I only understand myself dimly. I only understand the world. I only see dimly. One day I'll see face to face. But right now I just see dimly. One of the smartest people to have ever lived was a guy named Thomas Aquinas. Wrote brilliantly about who God is. Near the end of his life he walked into a church. When he was in the church, he had some kind of vision of God. He came out, and what he said, reflecting on all the work that he had done, is he said, it's all straw. Compared to the vision that I just got of who God is, this man who was so brilliant said, it's just a tiny percentage of what God is actually like. One day, we will see face to face. We will understand God. We will understand ourselves. We will understand each other. One day we will see clearly in this life, we're just trying to get a glimpse. What I'm going to show you this morning is a glimpse of what heaven is like. And a glimpse of the way that God sees us. And even though it's just a little bit, just a little bit, of an understanding of who God is, is a lot. So I'm going to invite you just to stick with us. There's heavy stuff here. And um, I'm going to try to make it as accessible to us as possible. But this imagery is dense and it's heavy. But if you stick with it, it's going to end up in a place that I think we'll understand it a little bit more and in a place where I think it's going to be pretty practical in how we live it out this week. I want to give you a prayer that I'm going to encourage you to be praying this week. It's a prayer that I did not make up. It's a part of a larger prayer. I've written it out. I keep it on my desk. I'm going to encourage you to be praying this this week. From Psalm 119. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. This is the slow, gradual work that God wants to do in our lives. One of the things we talk about around here quite a bit is that we hope that on Sunday mornings that we all grow just a little bit closer to Christ than we were when we walked in. Just these incremental small changes in our lives, turning further and further away from these, uh, these things and closer and closer to these things. I'm going to give you a shorthand prayer for this in just a minute, but this is what we're after, friends, is we are after getting just a glimpse of who God is, that we might be turned away from selfish gain and vanities and towards the life that he has for us. We're looking at the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible. Last week I told you there were 77. I lied to you. Last week I knew there were 66. I had no idea I said 77 until multiple people came up and told me afterwards. So thank you for that. Uh, 66 books in the Bible. The last one is the book of Revelation. And what Revelation is, is it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a revealing It is a revealing of the way that things actually are. It is as if a curtain is being pulled back. The revelation, the revealing, happens for a man named John. John may be the Apostle John who walked around with Jesus. He may be somebody else. But John is on one of the Greek islands, Patmos, and he has this vision. It is as if the veil between heaven and earth are pulled back and he sees clearly. He then does his best to write down what it is that he saw. But what it is that he saw cannot be explained in words. Now, what he wrote down was not only his best effort, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so it is instructive for us, but it it can't fully capture what it is that he saw. But he takes it in 22 chapters, writes down as best he can what it is that he saw, and then he sends it to seven churches, this letter, this vision, to seven churches in modern-day Turkey. 
And what he sends them was likely meant to be read, and if you know anything about Revelation, it's very dramatic, likely meant to be read in a dramatic way to the people in these seven churches to help them to understand more about how it ends and how we live between now and then. That's, that's the book of Revelation, what it is. And even though it wasn't written uh, to us, it's for us. There are things that we can learn in it. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but I wanted to put it back up there. This is a lot of what we walked through last week. Um, and you can take a picture of it, or I'm going to post it on my social media this week. It just gives you a, a brief overview of what um, is revealed, how it is revealed, and the purpose of it. The purpose of it is uh, to reveal truth so that it inspires people to persevere. It inspires people to repent. And it is instructive for us on how to live like a, a victorious life, how to end up on the right side of this whole deal. So at the beginning of the book, we get, as we talked about last week, these seven introductions in the book addressed to specific churches. And I really encouraged you to try to find yourself in there. That in each of those sections to the churches, there are things that folks are encouraged to keep doing, keep it up. And things that folks are encouraged to stop doing, to repent of. And I think it's a good place for us to be, to be saying, all right, if God was writing a letter to me, what would he encourage me to keep doing? What would he encourage me to stop uh, doing? So if you haven't done that homework, I would encourage you to do that, to reflect on that a little bit. And then after we get in Revelation, after we get those seven introductions, suddenly John is given this vision of what heaven looks like. Now, uh, look. The vision that he has given does not explain to us all of what the afterlife or the kingdom to come will be like. It does not explain all of that. It's just like 1%. But 1% can be a lot. So I'm going to read it for you. And then after I read it, I'm going to um, put some images up there to help us get our our eyes on what uh, what this looked like. But first, let me just remind you. He's using images, numbers, metaphors that would have made sense to people 2,000 years ago. They don't make sense to us today. Just because it doesn't make sense to us initially doesn't mean it didn't make sense to them. So what I want to show you first is um, the introduction to this and then an example of what um, it could have looked like today, like if it was being written today. Okay. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And once I saw in the Spirit... At once I saw in the Spirit, there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. So this is what it actually says at the beginning of chapter chapter 4. And then it uses all kinds of metaphor, imagery that people would have known about at the time. It would be like what I'm about to read you is something that I wrote, not in the Scripture. I'm very clear about that. Um, It would be like if if someone today was describing what heaven would look like. Um, I want you to see if you can figure out what some of these images are. And also notice that people 2,000 years from now probably won't get this. We described heaven like this. Surrounding the throne were 18 flags, each set in a small hole, surrounded by a sea of green. An army of men wielding swords with blunt ends cast white spheres through the air. As patrons watched on in silence amidst bushes set ablaze in pink, purple, and white flame until the spheres disappeared, eliciting roars from the faithful. If, if, oh, thank you very much. So uh, I don't know what to do with the fact that you didn't clap for the scripture, but that's okay. So, um, uh, so if, if I were to describe heaven like this, today, what would I clearly be describing heaven to be like? Augusta National, right? In 2000, some of y'all just got it. That's great. Okay. Um, if someone were to read that 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years from now, they would probably have no idea what that means. It's just these vague references that seem to make no sense at all. But, of course, it means something to us today. So our job today is to read this that was written 2,000 years ago with that in mind. So I'm going to read this for you, try to picture in your head what's going on, and then I'll kind of draw it out for you. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. It's given this picture. And the voice I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, that's Jesus, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. 
The one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. One of the things you'll notice as you read the Revelation is that John is um, relentless about not describing the one on the throne in any way that would lead you to believe that it is a human being who is sitting on the throne. A lot of us grew up with um, an image of God as if he's a guy with a long white beard sitting on the throne. It's as if John knew this was a temptation and is relentless about making sure that we know that the one sitting on the throne is not like the greatest thing within creation. Not the way that Caesar claimed to be God. Not the way that the Greek gods function, kind of like Marvel superheroes do today. So no, no, no. The God that I saw on the throne, I can't even describe, but nothing like a human being. Something completely different from us. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Picture all this. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. So if they have crowns, what are they? They're, they're rulers. They are in some way that we don't fully understand. They have some kind of authority in heaven. They're surrounding the throne. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. If you're following us online through the Bible reading plan, we'll be talking more about that. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. Now, four in the book of Revelation always represents the whole of, uh, of creation. Even today, we talk about how many corners of the earth, four corners of the earth. These four creatures, they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Again, there's more that we could talk about here. But big picture, they represent all of, all of creation. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, this is what these creatures did. All four. They never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, the point isn't that all people do in heaven is worship. That's not the point. The point is that they are wholly devoted to the one who is on the throne. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits in the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever. And this is what they do. They lay their crowns before the throne. Vital image here. They are rulers. They have crowns. They have authority and responsibility that God has given them. But they lay their crowns down before the throne. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. What is the distinction between the one on the throne and everything else? The distinction is, is that the one on the throne was not created. He is the source of everything else. This is the distinction. That everything outside of the throne was made by the one who sits on the throne. That may seem like a uh, kind of technical nuance, but I think this is one of the biggest things that we get confused about as followers of Jesus today. And is one of the biggest things that atheists are confused about, about what we believe. Is that we do not believe in some God that is floating around somewhere who is also a part of creation. We believe in a God who is outside of creation, who made the whole deal. The closest that we can get for a metaphor is one that I've used before. It is as if we are living in the fish tank. And we are way off when we imagine that God is the greatest thing in the fish tank. God exists outside of the fish tank. He exists outside of the water. He made the whole deal. And the book of Revelation is stubbornly insistent on making sure that we understand that. Okay, so this is the image that's given us of the heavenly throne room. Again, it's not the whole thing. And again, it doesn't answer your questions about who will be there and who won't be there. It doesn't answer your questions about what exactly it will be like. But it answers one of the most important questions. 
We pray oftentimes, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which implies there's something right about heaven and something wrong about earth. It answers the question, what is right about heaven? What's going right there? Here, here's a way to, to picture the scene we just saw. There's the throne. Who's on the throne? God is on the throne. Again, the one thing that is not created. Around the throne are the four living creatures, again, representing all of creation. Around that are the 24 elders that in some way are ruling over um, uh, the heavenly realm with God's authority. The four living creatures, all of creation, are oriented towards God. They're not trying to rule on their own. They're oriented towards God. And the elders, what do they do? They cast their crowns before the throne. Things are right in heaven because everything is ordered properly. Not right in some kind of vague moralistic sense, but right as in this is the way that the world is actually intended to work. The way that things are created to be. And you leave chapter 4 with this idea that the way things are in heaven is the way that things ought to be here. But they're not. Before we get to earth, there's one last kind of thing that's thrown in that's kind of surprising. Then I saw, this is in chapter 5, a lamb looking as if it had been slain. So it is, he gets this vision. Again, these are images. He gets this vision of a living lamb that has been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. It's not just the creator God who is on the throne, but the lamb is there also. God the Father shares the throne with the Lamb. And everything is oriented towards that. God the Father in heaven, the Lamb who came down to earth, sitting on the throne in heaven together. Hold on to this image. This is the way that things are in heaven, where everything is rightly ordered. John then gets a vision of what things are like on earth. And this is where some of the fireworks are. It says, this, this is the way that God sees things on earth. And we'll get to today, but this is 2,000 years ago first. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. The sea represents chaos. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. Beast rises up from the sea. The dragon, it goes all the way back to the beginning. It's the snake in the garden. It's the Satan. It is the devil. It's this uh, figure that the Bible talks about, though only vaguely, that is some kind of spiritual force that wants what is not good for the world. Jesus says he's a thief. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. So this spiritual creature sees this beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns. Uh, Horns represent in the ancient world strength. So it's like ten strong kings, and on each head a blasphemous name. What's going on with the seven heads? It actually tells us explicitly later. This calls for a mind with wisdom. So use your brain. Think about this, people. The seven heads represent or are seven what? Hills. Think, think back to uh, like high school history. What city was built on seven hills? Rome. Rome. Some of us know that now. Everybody knew that then. He's saying explicitly, look, who is the beast? We talked about this last week. The beast is the the emperor. The beast is Rome. So you can see, John does not have a favorable view of Rome. You'd be right to ask, what is his deal with Rome? I mean, what's his problem with them? Part of his problem with them is that they're killing Christians. That's part of it. But it goes beyond that. It's not just that they're killing Christians. Is that they are requiring people to, uh, to worship Caesar? Is that they are requiring people to worship false gods? It is that they are a military juggernaut that is expanding their borders by killing people and that internally is killing anybody who opposes them. It is that they have built an economic system that is built on the backs of the poor. It is all of these things. He rightly recognizes what is happening with Rome is not in line with the way things are supposed to be. You get this vision of heaven, the way things are supposed to be, then you get this vision of Rome. 
Now, as I read through the rest of this, you'll see things pop up over here. And as they pop up over here, just think about what's going on here. What's John painting a picture of? The beast I saw resembled a leopard. It had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and his authority. So the dragon has a throne and the beast is his representative on earth. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. We'll talk about that in the online Bible study. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast. And they asked, who is like the beast? I mean, who is like Rome? Who can wage war against it? Who could possibly challenge Rome? It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. There are other nations, there are other tribes. But it was given authority over them, it conquered them. And even those nations became vassal states to Rome. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. It is as if the whole world is following after the beast, which is Rome. And by following after Rome, unbeknownst to them, they're following after the dragon. It is as if the whole world is doing this. Pledging their allegiance to Caesar. Which is unbeknownst to them, pledging their allegiance to the great deceiver. So, what would you call this? I mean, it's, it's, it's as if you got somebody who is claiming that he himself is God and demanding worship. They're using their might to kill anybody who opposes them. They're building their wealth on the back of the poor. What would you, what would you call this? And again, he believes that all of this is animated by this evil spiritual force, the devil or Satan. What would, if you had to put a word on to describe this, what word would you use? Okay, terrorism. What word would you use? Here's a word that I would use. You know what this is? This is, this is antichrist. This is the opposite of the way that Christ intends the world to be. John lifts up this vision of the way the world's supposed to be in heaven. And then he paints this picture. And he says, shouldn't we want this to change? Shouldn't we desire this world to look more like that world? And then a little bit of hope. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. Except all those whose names have not been written in the book of the Lamb's book of life, those are the ones that will. The Lamb who was slain for creation of the world. So it's actually not the case that all people are worshiping the beast. There's this growing small movement called the church that even on earth is pledging its devotion here. In the book of Revelation, what it's pushing people to do is to say, look, here's the deal. Here's the deal. And again, just 2,000 years ago now, us in a second, here's the deal. You got your own little kingdom, which is your life. Maybe you rule over a lot. Maybe you just rule over your own little life. You got your own life. And you've got to ask yourself, where will I cast my crown? And Revelation is meant to encourage people who are already oriented towards this. And to call those who are falling into this to repentance. Because this has benefits in the moment. Just being like everybody else. Falling in line with what Rome expects from you. When in Rome, falling in line. But if you begin with the end in mind, you know, even though there may be hardship and persecution now, I know how the story ends. 
and I'm casting my crown here. I don't think that it's that hard to see how this still talks to us today. What are those things that are seeking to occupy your mind, that are seeking to define for you how it is that you should orient your life, what you should give your life over to? One of those things, I think some of the greatest tricks over here now are just the distractions that will cause us to just slowly waste away the minutes and the days of our lives. What is it that, that, it, that is seeking to get your attention, to occupy your mind? And in the moment, there may be thrills that come from that. But if you begin with the end in mind, you know that this wins out. If you had to sum it up, I, I think a lot of what this is about is saying, look, look, I mean, you want to live a life that's victorious. You want to live a life that, if part of the language he uses is conquerors, you want to live that kind of life? The number one thing you can do with your life is make God the number one thing in your life. Even worry less about this. Just what does it look like to orient your life towards this? Let me give you something really practical to do in a minute. Just a prayer. Before that, I just want to make sure that we're, we're locked in on this. I've talked about it a little bit the last couple of weeks. We'll make sure we're locked in on this. This is an individual endeavor in the sense that God really is asking you to consider what, what, do I, what do I need to be encouraged in? What do I need to repent of? God is really asking you to consider how is it that I cast my crown in the right direction? God is encouraging you to ask that. But this is not just a solo endeavor. This is also about uh, us as a society as a whole. I mean, the, these early Christians, I mean, as they began to grow and they were really faithful, it changed the community around them. It ultimately changed Rome, which is what we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. It changed everything. I mean, for you, for me, one of the things that we desire is we desire to see the kingdom come, not just in our lives, but we desire to see the kingdom come in the world. We desire to see the kingdom come in our city. And we're going to be talking a whole lot about this, friends. And what it looks like for us to pray for and to be a part of God's work for in Dallas is in heaven. What does it look like for God's work to be done more and more here? You're a part of, most of you know this, a church that is all about this work. That's been on the front lines of this kind of work for 100 years. But for us in this generation, what does it look like for us to be people who who are um, recognizing that ultimately the whole thing gets fixed in the end? And the only way it gets fixed is by God's grace? but that we want to be a part of living now to see not only our lives, but our city transformed also. So we're talking more about this. But really practical for this week, this is what I'm going to encourage you to pray. I'm going to encourage you to pray this. I'll pop it on my social media this week. You can take a picture of it. I'm going to encourage you to pray this. But if you want to boil that down, pray this. Father, I want what you want. I want what you want in my life. I want what you want in the people around me's lives. I want what you want in our city. But as I said to you a few weeks ago, if I'm being really honest with you, I often can't pray that prayer and mean it. The closest I get is, Father, I want to want what you want. I want to want what you want in my life. I want to want what you want in their life, even though I don't like them. If I'm being really honest, I don't actually want what's good for them, but I want to want what's good for them. I want to want what's good for our city. I want you to open my eyes to those ways that my life, those ways that our city are going in the wrong direction. I, I want to want what, what it is that you want. Will you more and more open my eyes? I was with somebody this week, and we were just talking about how lucky we are to live in Dallas, Texas. It is such a great city. And more and more, how is it that we are people who are investing in our city, that it may more and more reflect the love of God? If we want that for our city, it starts with us. Father, I want to want what you want. Okay. We're going to end the service a little bit different than we normally do. Band, you guys can come on out. Um, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to reflect. 
And what this reflection is all about is it's a song that's become one of my favorites recently. And it's a song that paints a picture of what it'll look like in the coming kingdom. Of what it'll look like then. So I hope that you will just sit, um, relax, just allow this song to paint a picture of what the kingdom will look like and invite uh, that image to inspire you inspire you today. There's a river we will know, ever clear and ever full, from the fount that overflows in the light of the King. And when we drink it, we will find that this joy ever full will ever rise. And it'll rise on in the kingdom, in the kingdom. Cause there is a far kingdom on the other side of the glass. And by a faint light we will see. Still there is more gladness and longing for the sight than to be hold or be filled by anything. And there's a river we will know ever clear and ever full from the fount that overflows in the light of the King. And when we drink it, we will find that this joy ever full will ever rise, and it all rise on in the kingdom, in the kingdom. There is a far, far kingdom at the end of the sea.
Go out this week becoming people who want what God wants, shepherding in moment by moment of heaven to earth here and now. Go in peace, friends. We'll see you next Sunday.